Dzień dobry Państwu. Na naszym zegarze wybiła już godzina 15, zatem czas zaczynać. Witam serdecznie na kolejnym webinarium wydawnictwa Macmillan, którego tytuł brzmi Close Encounters with Lexis for Matura and Beyond. Zanim przedstawię dzisiejszego prowadzącego, kilka słów ode mnie. Nazywam się Iwona Kubat i w wydawnictwie Macmillan jestem koordynatorem szkoleń. Dzisiejsze webinarium potrwa do godziny 16. Jeśli w trakcie webinarium pojawią się, u państwa, pojawią się u Państwa pytania, bardzo proszę skorzystać z okienka czatu, które widzicie na dole. Prowadzący postara się w miarę możliwości na nie odpowiedzieć. Naszym dzisiejszym trenerem jest znany wszystkim Państwu dr Grzegorz Śpiewak. Jeśli są wśród Dobra, Państwa... Jeśli są wśród Państwa osoby, które dołączyły po raz pierwszy, to ja tylko krótko o doktorze Grzegorzu. Grzegorz jest absolwentem Uniwersytetu Essex i Uniwersytetu Warszawskiego, na którym uzyskał tytuł doktora nauk humanistycznych i lingwistyki. Jest nauczycielem, trenerem nauczycieli, konsultantem i uznanym mówcą konferencyjnym, a od wielu lat jest związany z Macmillan Education, gdzie zajmuje stanowisko Head ELT Consultant i jest trenerem, trenerem kluczowych nauczycieli. Przypomnę również, że webinarium jest nagrywane. Będzie można je ponownie obejrzeć w dogodnej dla Państwa chwili. Materiały dodatkowe i certyfikaty uczestnictwa będą dostępne po webinarium na stronie internetowej szkolenia. Dzisiejsze webinarium otwiera również całą serię szkoleń online wspierających Państwa w przygotowaniu do egzaminów ósmoklasisty i maturalnego oraz egzaminów międzynarodowych. Zapowiedź kolejnych szkoleń widzą Państwo na slajdzie, natomiast już dzisiaj serdecznie zapraszamy do rejestracji. Chciałabym również przypomnieć, że Instytut MED to jest wyjątkowe miejsce dla nauczycieli, którzy chcą stale i w nowoczesny sposób doskonalić swój warsztat i rozwijać się jako profesjonaliści, ale również jako ludzie. Jesteśmy tutaj dla Państwa, aby Was wspierać, inspirować, podsuwać praktyczne pomysły i motywować do coraz lepszej pracy z uczniami i słuchaczami. Szczegółową ofertę Instytutu wraz z opisami webinariów oraz filmy, w których trenerzy opowiadają o zawartości szkoleń, znajdą Państwo na naszej stronie internetowej www.macmilan.pl w zakładce szkolenia. A teraz nie pozostaje mi nic innego, jak przekazać głos naszemu dzisiejszemu prowadzącemu, doktorowi Grzegorzowi Śpiewakowi. Halo, halo Grzegorzu, czy mnie słyszysz? Ja, ja słyszę bardzo, bardzo dobrze. Uh, how about you? Can you tell me if you can hear me and see me all right? Let's hope they can. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I'll switch to English straight away because that's you know, that's been announced from the very beginning. I'm delighted to see so many of you here. Uh, the numbers are absolutely amazing. Uh, so, you know, thanks very much for, for the trust. I hope you won't come away disappointed. Uh, I, I hope also that, that the part of the reason why so many of you are here today is that the topic itself is really, really interesting. Uh, interesting from the perspective of anybody, like, I guess, the great majority of you guys, anybody who's involved in uh, um, supporting learners in upper secondary education towards the final exam, particularly at its extended level, but not exclusively, as we will see in a moment. And uh, uh, if you are in that sort of situation, I hope you will find a lot of uh, uh, practical uh, advice in what is to come in the next 55, 60 minutes or so. Uh, now, before I explain a bit more this idea of close encounters with vocabulary, and I would like to say that uh, it's delightful to see so many friends uh, in the chat. I, I, you know, I keep seeing familiar names uh, as, as the chat moves 
through the window. And uh, it's quite a nice coincidence because I am actually going to be talking about vocabulary in terms of this particular metaphor, friendship and friends. And uh, to kind of warm everybody up a little bit, not that we need a lot of that in, on a warm day like today, uh, I would like to I would like to open with a very basic, sort of seemingly obvious question, and that is, you know, you obviously are familiar with uh, with the uh, movie reference uh, that, that I'm using. So my question to you guys is, what is the crucial difference between the people sitting in the front row in this picture and everybody else in the background? What is the key difference? I'll wait for a good answer. It will also be a way for me to check whether, you know, you're still getting my audio. Uh -huh. So what is the difference between the people in the front row and the people in the back? I, I, I saw relations, uh -huh, relationships, yes. Communication, it's all true. <laughs> the position of that body is definitely. Uh -huh. Okay, right. Someone just said spending time together. Thanks for that. It's very close to what I would like to to draw on. Uh, they, they are, you know, the, the ones in the front obviously are friends, you know, hence the, the, the famous sitcom title and uh, the others are not, right? So what distinguishes a friend from a non-friend? This is what I would like to come to and argue that in order for someone to count as a friend, uh, this other person with whom that person is, you know, going to become friends at some point, uh, they need to uh, uh, come into a certain type of uh, relationship, as a lot of you uh, have already said. And this relationship uh, involves at least two basic aspects. Right. Uh, Malgrata just said they simply know each other. Right. But what does it take to get to know each other deeply and intimately, which is definitely a prerequisite for calling anyone a friend. Well, you know, for the sake of this session, but also sort of on a wider scale, so to speak, uh, it's impossible to achieve without a, a rather substantial number of encounters. Correct? You know, you really need to get to meet that other person and not once and not in one type of situation, in a number of uh, different situations in order to, as some of you are already saying, in order to establish trust, in order to develop a certain amount of, of uh, mutual knowledge. And uh, if you are thinking now, what does this have to do with teaching vocabulary, teaching and learning vocabulary? Well, you know, the connecting uh, uh, thought is this idea of close encounters. And of course, from the perspective of this session, I'm going to be looking at close encounters, having close encounters with vocabulary in a foreign language. And uh, someone is saying also getting through difficult situations together. Well, you know, in a sense, we'll see some of that too in a moment. And, uh, you know, now that I said this, here is one such potentially difficult situation when it comes to one lexical item uh, coming into contact with another lexical item. Uh, let me give you an example of that. You know, the word attention, the English noun attention, uh, this noun attention has quite a bit of relevance from the perspective of a recent uh, matura examination. I wonder whether you can recognize uh, the reference straight away. I will make it a little easier for you and I'll show you the actual item that I have lifted from uh, a recent Matura paper. It's a basic Matura paper. Do you recognize this item by any chance? It's a recent one. Uh, it was quite a problematic one, wasn't it? Haha. <laughs> Some people are already saying C. I am very glad that uh, that I, I I am seeing the letter C. Pay attention. Now, why is that? Because of course, pay plus attention is possibly the strongest collocation, isn't it? The most frequent one. But the question is, was it really the collocation that was needed when it came? to this particular item. Let me refresh your memories and see you now we've just enjoyed two months of uh, summer holidays. The item in question that proved quite problematic across the country is this one. And to take a look, 8.2 is in line three. And now the question is, which of the three is actually the correct answer? Right, well, of course, 
you know, once you consider the context, the only one that works is give. Your, is it give? Take a look. There's an uptown train from this platform. And ladies and gentlemen, can I, what? Can I have, of course. So B, it is, can I have your attention and not can I pay your attention, please, right? Now, this item has proven really, really problematic to a great number of Matura takers in the year 2017, the basic level. Uh, it's a good illustration to me of an idea of, okay, knowing the word attention, but perhaps not being friends enough with the word attention, not being aware enough of uh, uh, just, you know, what encounter uh, of the word attention is uh, the one which is needed in this particular case, uh, which, in other words, of the three uh, potentially collocating verbs are appropriate uh, when you consider the context. It takes a certain intimate knowledge of the word attention and its surrounding or potentially surrounding verbs in order to pick the right item in, in this particular matura examination. Indeed, so as some of you are already saying, it's about context, isn't it? But in order to be able to notice the role of context, you also need to be more aware of uh, just how a particular item can function given different contexts. And uh, this is basic level. How about an example of a certain amount of uh, Right, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely with you, Marta. They don't pay attention to it at all, yes. So so let me uh, argue that this is a, a good reason to attend and get students to attend more to uh, the accuracy of uh, using a particular lexo lexical item, not just recognizing it superficially. And if this is true of a basic level, Matura, how much more true is it of, of the extended level, where, again, I'll show you one of those really problematic items. A lot of the Matura takers in 2017 found this particular item in the listening task problematic. And I will argue in a moment that the reason is, again, insufficiently close, insufficiently intimate relationship with the key vocabulary items that are at stake here. So. The, the phrase that proved problematic, got misinterpreted a lot, was the phrase benefited financially. Now, let me show you the relevant bit of the transcript. That's the relevant bit of the transcript in which I'm sure you can immediately see uh, where the problems were. Uh, if you look at the word benefit and then you look at uh, damages, then, you know, to people who only know these words superficially, this does not sound like the appropriate context, but of course it is. But in order to be able to recognize this, one also needs to know that, for instance, the plural damages is a completely different meaning from the singular damage, to take one example, right? And of course, to pay someone damages brings in a completely different meaning from the word pay, the word substantial, and from the word damage or damages uh, itself. And uh, once we are at it, it's also interesting uh, that the word or the phrase settled with in this particular statement, of course, is a, a different meaning than the meaning, the basic meaning of the verb settle without the accompanying uh, 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 preposition or adverbial particle. So the, the message is, I think quite obvious, and it is that in order to do well at a high stake examination like the Matura at both levels, but particularly at, uh, at the extended level, one really needs to develop a certain amount of lexical accuracy. And it's sort of interesting for me, as someone who has been in this profession for a long, long time, uh, uh, in that uh, I'm sure uh, some of you at least will recall that uh, over the last few years, we tended to uh, concentrate more or relatively more on the fluency part of language use and perhaps downplaying along the way those more, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, those aspects of uh, precision, aspects of uh, accuracy, and uh, the more one looks at uh, uh, the items which actually prove problematic to matura takers, the more one comes to the conclusion that it is exactly this relative neglect or lack of attention um, on the student's part, but, you know, 
our role, of course, is to try and induce it uh, uh, that may lead to those sorts of problems when the examination day comes. Uh, Yes, I, I, I absolutely agree with what Dorota just wrote, that, which is the sort of downside of emphasizing successful communication. Of course, communication is something which we certainly wish to promote up to a certain proficiency level. Beyond that level, however, other aspects start uh, paying uh, an increasingly greater role. And that's, I think, where we need to perhaps refocus our pedagogical antennae. So thank you very much for that particular comment. I apologize in advance, by the way, uh, you know, for not addressing every single comment. There are so many and they are uh, running so fast through the screen that I'm only able to to notice uh, every other comment. But, you know, keep on writing because I think it's great that we can have that interaction and I'm sure other people can benefit. I think I'm back. Am I? <laughs> Sorry, but we got logged out. It must be because of all of the people logging in all the time. You know, the, the server must be under terrible strain. <laughs> but great to see you back. Okay, super. All right. So, you know, I wonder whether you heard the last um, sentence that I was trying to, uh, to communicate, which was that, uh, uh, you know, I'm using those two examples and uh, one more coming up in a moment to uh, illustrate uh, an important point, which is that uh, 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 over the, the past few years, maybe even more than the past few years, uh, there has been a relative defocusing on the precision or accuracy side of things when it comes to language use at a relatively advanced level to the detriment of uh, of the learner and you know and the uh, ultimate success or lack thereof when it comes to um, a formal high stake examination and uh, uh, what I intend to achieve uh, in the course of this session is in a sense try and uh, redress that balance for you. Uh, there is one more example which I think is also quite telling, and it is this one. Uh, you know, item B, the, and the the adjective hazardous. It's quite interesting. It's quite interesting that uh, that uh, you know we know what that is, do we not? Uh, it's a false friend, and that's precisely what proved so problematic to a lot of learners. And it's also a, a nice uh, a nice uh, mm, uh, way for me to remind you of my of my main metaphor, which is that uh, in order to uh, get to know a certain lexical item more deeply, more intimately, friend-like, one needs to uh, engage with this item uh, uh, more than once, meaningfully, in a number of varied contexts. And that's what I intend to address uh, for the remainder of this session. Uh, how is the quality of the sound at the moment? Is it okay? A couple of people said, uh, perhaps, all right, excellent. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad that, that we've overcome that little glitch. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, returning to the notion of lexical accuracy as a certain project for us all. When I say all, I mean both the, uh, the teacher and the student. Um, you know, how can we promote lexical accuracy? Well, there are at least two sort of, you know, brush stroke, two types of responses that we can have to that kind of um, uh, task, that kind of challenge. So, you know, one way 
kind of obvious would be to say, well, you know, if you want them to be more accurate, they simply need to expand the size of that vocabulary. We need to teach them more words. And, you know, it's a respectable position. Uh, and if anybody is thinking that, then in a sense, you know, we are in very good company. I would like to uh, bring in two quotes from relatively recent research on vocabulary. One is here uh, from Hacking and Block in 1993, who, as you can see, uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, a lack of vocabulary knowledge is one of the largest obstacles for second language readers to overcome. And, you know, as, as the quote suggests, there is a very uh, direct relationship between one's breadth of vocabulary knowledge and uh, uh, one's reading competence. And those two, of course, are not alone in that position. Uh, uh, another set of researchers, same year, by the way, so it must have been a very good year for vocabulary studies, uh, found out that the main obstacle for um, second language readers is not lack of reading strategies, but rather insufficient vocabulary knowledge in English. And this point is interesting, again, because if you, like me, um, have lived through the years of, the, if you like, the mainstream communicative language teaching propaganda, if I may call it that, then no doubt you will have lived through uh, the times where all the focus was on developing the strategies you know, beyond individual macro skills. And here we are seeing more and more that uh, it's not the skill as such, but it's the skill, but necessarily married to a certain um, amount of lexical competence, the breadth of vocabulary learning. And uh, of course, th those people and this particular research is by no means isolated. There have been people like Catherine Walker, uh, to give one example, who've you know argued for years and years that uh, uh, you need to bring the learner over the minimum threshold level in terms of the number of vocabulary items that they know before anyone's reading uh, strategy can activate in L2. And uh, Catherine in particular has always argued that uh, in a sense we have a reading strategy in L1, so that's not a problem. The problem is harnessing that strategy to a certain level of lexical competence beyond which there simply isn't anything or not enough for the strategy to uh, get boosted upon, so as to speak. So, uh, uh, so that is one side of things. But of course, if this was all that was to it, you know, that would be the end of the session. I would just say, OK, so, you know, from now on, let's just, you know, give them all the vocabulary that we have and hope for the best. But uh, there is more to it. And that's why uh, there are, you know, 40 more slides uh, in this session that I would like to engage you with. And uh, uh, my bridge, if you like, is the following. Well, first of all, OK. There is such a thing as the size, and the size definitely matters. But, you know, again, to return to my metaphor of friendship, you know, uh, the word friends has uh, acquired a rather new meaning in recent years, at least ever since Facebook <laughs> uh, uh, mushroomed uh, on, uh, on people's uh, smartphones. Because, of course, one of the things that we have on Facebook these days, we have friends. But, you know, it's friends in inverted commas, isn't it? Uh, you know, I, I recently checked the number of so-called friends on my own personal Facebook wall, and it's over 1,000. Now, of course, nobody can realistically have 1,000 close friends, right? So, of course, the word friend has been subject to a huge amount of inflation. Uh, isn't that right? And, and that is, you know, OK, so we can have so-called friends, but this does not mean that I am in any kind of meaningful, intimate relationship with the great majority of these so-called friends. Now, does this translate in any way to vocabulary knowledge? Well, first of all, let me say, <laughs> yeah, inflation does sound excellent, doesn't it? Thank you, Dorota. OK, so, you know, size. Size, of course, matters to a certain to a certain degree, to a certain extent. But, but, there is a big but. 
<laughs> different shades of relationship. Thanks for all of those wonderful comments. Okay, so size does matter, but there's definitely more to it, particularly when it comes, but not exclusively, when it comes to vocabulary knowledge. So uh, now I'm going to turn serious again. Right, so Eva has just said it beautifully. It's not only about the size, but also about the usage and the revision. Well, Eva, you're kind of doing that session for me already. Thank you very much. But uh, uh, what I would like to engage you in now is a little puzzle. Uh, please, you know, we are almost ready to start a new school year. Here is a little something, um, uh, a little piece of research coming from one of the world's greatest authorities on vocabulary learning, uh, Paul Nation. Uh, who, amongst other things, has uh, done a lot of excellent work trying to see just what sort of number of words will get a person to do what sort of communicative or linguistic task. And uh, 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 for your particular, uh, for this particular session, a, a question to you guys. Uh, what do you think is hidden under the question marks? So how many words, what kind of word level makes up about 87% of the words in an average general English text. And notice, interestingly, also 80% of an average academic text. I'm seeing a lot of very good answers. Mm -hmm. You know, they vary a little. Now, according to Paul Nation, and of course, you know that, you know, with any kind of research like that, uh, the ultimate assessment does depend to a certain extent on what definitional criteria uh, you apply, but uh, his answer is indeed 2000. Uh, speaking of Paul Nation, if I can just point to one recent reference, which I would really like to recommend to you. This is a joint publication where uh, Paul is one of the co-authors, How Vocabulary is Learned. Uh, if you are not familiar with this yet, it's Stuart Webb and Paul Nation. Uh, it's a rec recent volume, uh, which is absolutely seminal for anybody who wishes to sort of get a deeper uh, um, sense of what sort of strategy uh, could be applied based on most recent uh, research fund, uh, findings in uh, uh, vocabulary acquisition in, in a second language. So, uh, I, I, as I said, I do, do recommend it. So, 2,000 words, not, you know, 10, not 20,000, not 50,000 words. And to put some extra flesh on the 2000, since of course it's you know quite an abstract number, I have another little task for you, which is the following. Uh, imagine that you look at the words in the top of the slide, okay? And uh, uh, the task for you guys is the following. Of those uh, 15, which would you say would fit in with the 2000 level, which would be within the 5,000 most frequent items range, and which would go in the 10,000 item range. Uh, um, I'll give you a moment to play with this. Okay, so potato is in the 2,000, hotel is in the 2,000, okay. Ambiguous 10,000, all right. Keep on playing. Media 2,000, interesting, we'll see. Conquest 10,000. All right, well, you'll, you'll be in for some surprises in a moment. Some are obvious, aren't they? I mean, of course, hemorrhage is 10,000, must be, in that collection. Okay, thanks for the guesses. Now, you know, it's, it's just a guess game, isn't it? But what's the point? Well, the point is, uh, I am guessing most of these words are on your teaching plan, aren't they, in Litaum, right? But the question that I think we can confront quite interestingly with Paul Nation's research is, okay, so they are all on our agenda, but perhaps they do not merit equal attention. And interestingly, again, if you follow uh, Paul Nation's reasoning, maybe somewhat counterintuitively from, you know, a, a perspective of, a, uh, of an ambitious teacher of English at a post-secondary or upper-secondary level. Uh, Counterintuitively, uh, those that merit a lot of attention are those which are seemingly very basic level. And why is that? Because on the one hand, they make up the, you know, 80% of any 
text, and that includes uh, popular academic texts, but more interestingly, it is those that will display a number of idiosyncratic uses, shades of being, things that are very easily drawn upon when it comes to creating a test item. And you know what I'm going to say next. These are precisely the items which students typically find problematic when it comes to uh, you know, test items like the ones that I started out from when I exemplified, uh, 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 the, the, you know, they use those examples from the recent Matura papers. So uh, this is what I would like us to confront very seriously. The answers, by the way, you know, in case you need an answer like me, compete, fair, hotel, legal and TATO are in the 2000 level, facts are document, ambiguous, investigate and media are in the 5000 level, and the rest, nomad, retort, conquest, malicious, and hemorrhage, 10,000 level. And again, uh, you know, make no mistake, I am not trying to argue we should stop teaching retort, okay? Of course, we want them to know retort. But what I am saying is that perhaps before you focus their energy on the retort, it would be very useful for them to know more basic level synonyms of retort, such as what? What would we teach before retort when it comes to that meaning? You know, higher frequency synonyms of retort. Reply. Answer back. Uh-huh. Maybe respond even. Talk back. You see? Absolutely. Okay. And, you know, again, I'm not saying stop teaching retort, but I am saying may, make uh, make sure that it is reply, uh, that they really, really know deeply and intimately because it will be more than likely that uh, a synonym or a close synonym or a collocation or a colligation of uh, uh, reply or respond rather than retort appears as an item that they will need to productively attend to when it comes to Matura teaching. I hope that it makes sense, but uh, I will confront uh, this whole idea of you know vocabulary breadth or size of vocabulary uh, that a learner might want to have uh, even more um, uh, 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 sort of acutely, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, uh, in order to do this, I have a little anecdote to share with you. It's uh, to do with my early years as an academic lecturer. I spent my early days in this profession teaching at the English department of Warsaw University. And uh, I recall very vividly those early years where we used to have a huge amount of uh, uh, um, um, work in year one focusing on developing students vocabulary of vocabulary size uh, I, I recall myself as a student you know six hours per week of uh, something that was called block and that was to do with with mostly vocabulary learning and uh, uh, why is this important because of course the result of this teaching was that some students did indeed learn some crazy vocabulary and then can you imagine this examination day where, you know, I am sitting with a colleague and I have the first student who comes in and has a picture to describe featuring this or similar item of furniture. Okay, I can see that there is some other victim of that. Right, a list of 1000 words. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, imagine this student entering my examination room and uh, saying, among, amongst other things, that this is a nice piece of upholstered furniture. And, of course, you know, the first person that said this, upholstered, you know, we kind of looked at each other, this colleague and, and myself, and said, okay, you know, a nice piece of vocabulary used in the appropriate context, you know, brownie points for the student. And you might say, okay, so very well, uh, you know, he or she knew a, a crazy, relatively uh, rare piece of vocabulary and she or he impressed the examiner with it. Sounds great, doesn't it? Except, you know, what happened next? A second student came in. They got that picture and you can guess, right? That student also felt compelled to use the word upholstered. So we thought, hmm, that's a coincidence, isn't it? And then a fourth student and a fifth student and a tenth student came in. And just about 
every student that had this item to describe felt compelled to impress us with the word upholstered. And of course, by the seventh or eighth person, we almost burst out laughing. It was so weird because, of course, the frequency of that item, given how much we started hearing it was nothing like the normal frequency of occurrence of course it was not the poor student's fault it was in a sense my fault because uh, our strategy at that time was to give them a lot of crazy items to learn okay so this is what i'm trying to argue size is okay but uh, up to a point only and it's much more okay and much more relevant from the perspective of students' needs to attend to closeness of selected items. And that's what I would like to uh, spend the rest of this session with. And, uh, you know, when you think in terms of closeness of vocabulary knowledge, there are arguably two sides to it. One side is that a student needs to notice that there is even an issue there, you know, that it uh, makes a difference whether you say have attention, pay attention or give attention. And uh, one of you said earlier on in, in, in a comment that uh, students uh, sort of, you know, as a population do not tend to attend to this of themselves very well. So that's what I would like to turn to in a moment. And the second aspect, of course, is uh, when it comes to using language productively, again, precision from a certain level onwards will matter more and more. So the question is, how do we promote precision at a relatively advanced level? And that's what I would like to look at uh, for the rest of the session. As I said, not something that is necessarily intuitively true of uh, the majority of learners. So I think there is a real uh, issue here. How do we sell the idea of worth noting, uh, noticing, uh, uh, aspects of precise use of uh, of vocabulary items in L2. Uh, and here I'm going to use an anecdote that I have borrowed from a great colleague and as you well know uh, the author of a wonderful new book for upper, upper secondary students Marta Roszynska who sold me the following anecdote from her own classroom. She said you know she had uh, uh, this uh, rather naughty student a couple of years ago, uh, who sort of refused to acknowledge any kind of uh, value in deciding uh, 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 on the, the difference between these two. You know, keep an eye on, keep the eye on, it's the same difference, means the same teacher. You know, why should I bother? And uh, uh, Marta got properly annoyed in the course, and at some point she came up with, a, I think, a rather neat response which i would like to offer to you uh, and i hope that perhaps you will find this useful for uh, your own naughty students like, like that so she said to this particular student of hers look now how about looking at your own language does it make any difference whether you say rzuć okiem nad rzuć okiem na rzuć oczyma na patrz okiem na they all kind of mean the same and of course you know, the guy immediately said, well, you know, the other three kind of don't make sense. They are not, you know, normal Polish. And Marta said, well, precisely. So it's not only about rough meaning, but it's about which particular, sometimes small items one needs to use, such as whether it's preposition na or preposition nad, in order for uh, a piece of language to be used correctly. Okay, so this is a little a little anecdote from somebody else's classroom. And now the question, okay, so how do we promote the noticing of the uh, features of lexical accuracy uh, uh, with our students? And uh, what you can see in this particular slide is a selection of, of uh, uh, exercise types, which I am sure most of you will, will just say, okay, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, mainstream activity types and my response is absolutely because it's those mainstream activity types which in my experience and a lot of the colleagues that I've talked to about this issue uh, tend to get the students to notice aspects of vocabulary use really really effectively I will exemplify one or two uh, with you uh, 
Dorota says, ponieść zwycięstwo, odnieść klęskę. Another great set of examples. Thank you, Dorota. Absolutely, I think worth adding immediately. Uh, opiekać, opiekować się. Okay, brilliant, Ania. All right, so, you know, it's, it's this idea of getting them to see that when it comes to their own language, it is precisely those so-called small, minute items that make all the difference, in a sense. Okay, so now, uh, some of those examples, let's take selecting the correct option, you know, a very basic uh, familiar exercise type. Uh, familiar as it is, it's one of the most effective ones, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to getting the students to notice that it does make a difference whether, in a lot of situations, you go for the work or job, fact or facts in the plural, dress or wear, complete or finished, etc. You know, synonyms or near synonyms, and yet, when it comes to actual use, it does matter which one you choose, particularly, particularly from a certain level onwards. And, uh, uh, you know, to kind of lighten the mood for a moment, here is a little gem that I found on uh, my Facebook wall from English Jokes, uh, which I think is a just brilliant example. And again, if you wish, you can easily use it with your students as well. Uh, you will have access to all of these slides uh, after the session. Good one, isn't it? Yeah, so you, you'd say complete and finished. Okay, so I see that teachers are amused. That's always a good sign. Okay, no, but I mean, seriously, right? There is something that is obviously at stake here, right? Complete and finished and a lot of others. So what I would like to suggest to you is that, you know, when you are thinking in terms of which activities you wish to uh, draw your students' attention to, then this is a great, <laughs> a great, uh, uh, activity type, and I'm using uh, my first example from Marta Roszynska's new repetitorium for upper secondary students, and I think it's a brilliant exercise type. Look, you know, number one is that every company has its own wear code or dress code. It does matter. One is a complete normal stable expression, the other one is not, and so on and so forth. Of course, Marta being a great practicing teacher, also knows that one encounter with this kind of uh, uh, focusing work will not be enough. So later on in the unit, she will definitely revisit some of this vocabulary and she will get her students, and I hope your stud students as well, if you uh, choose to use that particular book, uh, to recycle, revisit, and maybe use in a slightly different way in order to uh, give the student not just a repetitive but varied exposure, varied encounters with this particular set of vocabulary items. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, it is a cool exercise. Thank you, Andre. I think you know it's a great sequence and also is a wonderful selection of items which clearly draw on real problems of real Polish students because, of course, Marta being a Polish wonderful Polish teacher of English knows exactly what sort of uh, collocational issues there are uh, on a regular on a regular basis. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, your uh, sort of enthusiastic. Uh, appraisal there and but, but again returning to like the the big picture uh, my argument here is that again looking at the work of Paul Nation and others one could almost argue that from a certain level onwards at least just about all of language knowledge is actually collocational knowledge there's no such thing as just knowing items superficially and isolation so one of the key strategies for us both at the noticing level and at production level that I'm going to turn to in a moment is to promote this sort of vocabulary knowledge and again most importantly with items which are relatively frequent that's the message that I would like you to sort of get away from this session so focus attention on the collocational life of those frequent items as our absolute must strategically uh, another exercise type which will definitely drive this and perhaps even more depth is this explain the difference uh, no language improvement without collocations absolutely monica thank you very much okay so let me give you again a great example of this uh, of course you know it takes a great teacher stroke author to select the right examples but take a look at those ones for instance from marta's new repetitorium make a mess in your life versus make a mess in your room 
a light room versus a light meal. Explain the difference. And explain here means really uh, take a phrase and uh, provide a synonym that will bring out the difference in meaning. It's a very, very uh, 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 heavily engaging vocabulary. Yes, collocational minimal pairs. Absolutely, Dagmara. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and uh, perhaps, you know, last but not least, I, you know, I could, of course, exemplify every single one, but I hope that you get my general picture. And I'm just picking a few examples to show you that this is part of a very intensive, premeditated, potentially premeditated program, which should occupy us throughout Liceum, not just uh, or technicum, you know, not just at the very end when we start and students start panicking a little bit, but as a strategy overall for the duration of upper secondary segment. Uh, the title of which book, Magdalena? Uh, please tell me which book you want me to. Is it Paul Repetitorium? Okay, uh, it's uh, this one. It's, Ma it's Magdalena. Repetitorium. Only you can find all about it on on uh, our Macmillan uh, uh, pages and uh, web page as well as on Facebook. So uh, take a good look. Uh, one more example uh, of translation. Of course, I do not mean here chunks of text to translate, but what I do mean is getting students to actively look at comparing texts in the two languages. I'll, gi I'll give you one example, which I think is brilliant. Again, taken from Marta's book. Uh, take a look at the Polish text first with me, just a, a couple of sentences, you know, the first one. Istnieją różne rodzaje bratnich dusz. Są nimi nasi przyjaciele, sympatia, brat czy siostra. And, you know, you see what I mean, do you not? Even the word sympatia, well, clearly it's not the word sympathy, right? It's another word, right? And, you know, it is only through getting students to notice how one text works in parallel with another text that you can try to get them to notice uh, just how much it takes to uh, learn the, the so-called core or basic level vocabulary uh, um, uh, intimately enough. Uh, as I said, I could go on and on on this noticing aspect. I love this and I do a lot of work in it myself with my learners wherever I have an opportunity. But I also wish to give you a little bit of uh, uh, pointers uh, to the other aspect of this lexical accuracy, and that is uh, the aspect of uh, use or production. And again, from this perspective, uh, from this perspective, a little puzzle for you guys, okay? Those two expressions of English, cup of tea and lift a finger, they have something in common, and I would like you to tell me what? Cup of tea and lift a finger. They have an, an aspect of use in common. Okay. I saw a correct answer from one person, another person. Oh, okay. I'm getting a lot of this. Okay. I hope you've noticed. They are, in fact, they have a negative connotation, do they not? when they are used correctly. And to prove this to you, of course, not you yourselves, you know this, but to your students, I think it's great, again, to show them an aspect of using these correctly or incorrectly, as the case may be. Take a look. On pomaga w domu, translation, he lifts a finger around the house. Good translation. Oh, lubię czytanie. Reading is my cup of tea. Weird, isn't it? Both. Why are they weird? They kind of, you know, they kind of mean what we want, but given that the two expressions actually have negative connotations, what would be uh, idiomatic to say is he does not lift a finger around the house, right? Or reading is not my cup of tea, you see? So this is the kind of uh, uh, extra uh, which in a, which intimate knowledge of this particular item entails. And uh, and if you only know this superficially, you're probably going, you are going to use this uh, um, unidiomatically uh, or even uh, not appropriately. And uh, again, 
I would like to amplify my key message that I keep on pounding throughout today, which is that both cup of tea and lift a finger are composed of very basic level items. But the fact that they are composed of basic level items does not mean that the combination the resulting combination is basic level. And this is the kind of message which I think a student at a certain level simply needs to take in and uh, make use of when it comes to significant vocabulary learning. And again, as with the other side, the side of noticing, what are the key exercise types that will help the student develop this aspect of you know, productive, meaningful use of vocabulary with a certain degree of precision. Again, I am guessing you will not be surprised by virtually any of these. They are well-known exercises. What I am saying is that in the hands of a conscious, wonderful modern teacher, those exercise types are the ones which I think should be relied on a lot when it comes to driving this particular aspect of uh, uh, linguistic competence. Beginning with writing sentences with an item or a set of items, and I wonder whether it's true of your students, but in my experience, this is not a favorite exercise type with a lot of students, and yet I would insist, yeah, ex ex exactly, yeah, they hate it even, <laughs> okay, right, but you know, even so, I would insist that taking them through a certain selection of uh, the moments where they actively do that is a wonderful way of driving this particular aspect of comp competence. Again, let me give you an example from Marta's work. You know, this selection, determined, obstinate, self-assured, self-important. You've noticed straight away that one of them is negatively connotated, the other one is not. So that's what Marta says here for each pair. Decide which of the words has a negative and which has a positive connotation. But of course, we shouldn't stop at this, should we? Because it's, after all, about aspects of productive use. So how about getting them to produce complete sentences? Imagine that they work in pairs and one of them picks one of these items and needs to construct a sentence that will bring out either the positive or the negative aspect of a particular item. And the other student needs to imagine a little but response, okay? So for example, he is so tight-fisted that he never goes out with us, but the other student will have to say, but by being so economical, he can buy a new iPhone every year, you see? And getting the student in pairs to do that sort of thing, again, is a way perhaps to get them to like it a little more, as Joanna now suggested, but also, and, and more importantly, it's a way to get them to actively notice aspects of, in this case, positive or negative connotation, which is crucial when it comes to those particular items. Let me just take a sip of water. Okay, so, I hope that um, I've given you a certain uh, overall vision on how we should address the challenge of developing aspects of lexical accuracy or precision or, uh, uh, in general, higher level lexical competence with our students. And uh, to kind of summarize this and uh, give you a, a sort of nice, neat way of, uh, of remembering this, I suggest a sort of 3M strategy. So if you want to promote lexical accuracy, then of course we need to attend to quantity as well as quality. And the strategy would be through as many as possible, as you see, yeah, multiple, meaningful and memorable encounters with vocabulary. If you are thinking, okay, but you know, this sounds like a nice, neat, uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, phonetically uh, attractive um, pronouncement, but how can we draw on specific material and be able to do that? Well, let me again give you examples of, for instance, how I think Marta Roszynska thinks when she designs her own materials. And, you know, when I, when I started flipping through in the pages of this new repetitorium, it struck me that this is a wonderful teacher stroke writer at work. Marta understands how it is. You know, take an example like this one. Divide the expressions in the box uh, into the given categories. 
as you can see, those have to do with money and finance. So you have money, hours, perks, promotion. Okay, a great categorization exercise. One encounter. Okay, but this is example exercise number eleven in this, you know, sequence in the unit. Does she stop at that? Well, of course she doesn't. You know, being a great teacher, she will then have another exercise, in this case, number 12, in which she says, in your notebook, translate the parts of the sentences in brackets into English using some of the expressions from exercise 11, you see? So she's well aware of the need to engage them at a multiple, meaningful, and hopefully memorable level. And, a few exercises down the line, she will have yet another go at it and says, work in pairs, choose two of the following jobs and discuss the pros and the cons of uh, doing them. Use as many expressions from this unit as you can, you see? So that's what I mean by meaningful, multiple and memorable. And uh, if you like me, start flipping through the pages of this particular book, you will have a lot of joy because this is generally how her teacher stroke author mind uh, has been working when, when designing this material. Now, to say goodbye, I just have one or two, <laughs> three M rules, thank you, thank you, Olga. Uh, uh, say goodbye, I just have one or two uh, final ideas for you to take away. And then, and then we'll have to close. The first of these ideas is about an exercise format, which I am sure you all know and you have used a number of times. Do you recognize this kind of exercise? Sofa, chair, bed, cupboard, uh, coffee table and mirror. What would be the task? Absolutely, it's an odd one out, isn't it? You know, I have to say that uh, I have come to, uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with odd one out. It's a, it's a fun exercise. However, isn't it also true that in a sense, it's an exercise that sort of underplays the potential of this kind of list? Why does it do it? Well, because in a sense, as it stands, it's only a test, isn't it? Either a student knows that BET, B-E-T, is not an item of furniture, or they do not. If they do, they will say bet. That's the end of the story. Right, right. Marta is getting very close to what I am about to say next. Now, uh, Lindsay Clanfield, a wonderful teacher and a wonderful writer as well, uh, uh, has uh, introduced me to a variation upon this exercise type, which uh, I, I would like to sell to you at the end of this session, okay? So take a look. I am going to introduce a small, but significant change to this one odd one out. Are you ready? Okay, so now the items are sofa, chair, bed, cupboard, coffee table, and mirror. And the question is, which one is the odd one out now? Would you be able to answer that? Which one? Okay, but not just mirror, but explanation, please. Why mirror? I'll wait. Why is it mirror? Because it's vertical. Let's see. Can a, can a cupboard not be vertical? Can a, um, can a toffee ta coffee table? Mirror is not a piece of furniture. Uh, it's arguable. Can buy it. Mirror in the bathroom? Not necessarily. You, I can have a mirror in the bedroom. Not on the ground. Okay, interesting. Okay, but a cupboard does not necessarily need to be. Uh, no wood, possible, but not obligatory, you see. On the wall, cupboard can also be on the wall. Cupboard in the, okay. The cupboard in the kitchen, uh, but uh, a chair can be in the kitchen as well. Okay, well, I, I hope you get the picture. Look, there are over 500 of us in the room and all of us are language teachers and see how much language it has generated when I asked you for justification. In other words, uh, as soon as you make all of them similar and ask for an odd one out and an explanation, it forces the student to give you a story. And look, 
they are still coming excellent i am so i hope you will be able to see them slower when we finish and you will watch the recording because it's brilliant there are is there an explanation ha huh. good question dagmara well the answer is of course at some point you will get them to negotiate and say and say stabilize on one of them okay and, you know producing a story that they all accept and you know what happens next and that's the brilliance of uh, Lindsay Clanfield, I think. Once they've decided that, let's say, it is a mirror, okay, you know what you take, you, what you do to them, you say, okay, so let's play this game again. Now we remove the word mirror from the list, okay, and you have to start the exercise again. And that's a brilliant one because notice now, once they've attached themselves, to a hypothesis, you take it away from them and you force them to re-examine the items and come up with more uh, explanations with the same vocabulary set. The lovely thing about it is, yes, it promotes great discussion. It can be done at very basic levels, by the way, and the explanations could be given in Polish even. Doesn't stop, I think, this exercise from being valuable. Because what matters is that you force the students to really engage with those items and come up with stories, effectively, that will connect or disassociate items, you know, one from another. Okay, so I'll uh, leave you with this odd one out, odd two out, odd three out even, you know, if you have a long enough list to start with from Lindsay Clanfield. Uh, I hope uh, you will find a lot of joy with it. And uh, my final exercise for today uh, uh you know hopefully the other one was memorable as well but i have one more uh, to give you before we say goodbye and it is uh, based on the following question you know when close friends that remember have been my metaphor for today when they meet up after work in the evening what do they do they chat yeah what else do they do they hug maybe kiss Ooh, that those very very close friends drink yes i'm still waiting for one more thing that they might be doing gossip nag eat hug drink and talk nobody's saying this yes yet they also i'll give you a hint because i'm nice they also do that don't they yeah they play okay so notice one one uh, aspect which we certainly shouldn't neglect when it comes to promoting lexical accuracy is an element of genuine play but you know meaningful language play and for that i'm going to finish with sort of uh, showcasing something that we are very very proud of at macmillan thanks to uh, uh, my great colleagues at uh, at our department we have come up with something uh, that accompanies the wonderful repetitorium that marta produced and it is a set of uh, uh, a set of uh, um uh, playing cards called forbidden words and it's you know a, a variation on the familiar taboo game except of course it's an english game and in the vocabulary uh, there are 80 cards 80 cards so it's a nice set each card as you see features two items on one side and two items on the other 80 so there are 320 words all drawn from the repetitorium so it's key items and you know it's a wonderful way to play taboo so again let, let me just finish with a little something so let's let's play together shall we okay queen live and house what's the taboo what's the tab word or term queen live and house could be castle yes it could be uh-huh a more specific one, Buckingham Palace. Absolutely. Very good. Okay, congratulations. Now, the one that you can see upside down, sad, worry, and cry. What is what is the taboo one? Yes, I see it already. It is the word upset. Now, it's a familiar uh, exercise type, but you have a whole set of items taken from each of the units of the repetitorium and there's a selection of items on each of the 14 units so uh, you know a lot of joy potentially i hope and uh, you know of course we can either play the classic taboo or you can uh, have any number of uh, variations on it for instance you 
actually show them the, the taboo term like shy and the three items like talk, people and afraid and ask them in pairs or small groups to come up with as many other words that could be added uh, and then could be used in order to play the taboo and so on and so forth. By the way, with further ideas on how to use these taboo cards as well on our Macmillan website. So if you want, uh, uh, then uh, you are more than welcome to take a look. And the, the you know this is available from the Macmillan store website uh, uh, online shop as well. So I hope you'll have a, a lot of joy at the beginning of the year. All right, so uh, time to finish. So I would like to just ask you uh, to finish off with one more uh, reference to my metaphor is, is there any takeaway message that you would like to take for yourselves? Anything that has sort of stuck with you um, after the, the last 16 minutes of your life? If so, you'll be lovely to see it. Sort of a one-liner. <laughs> Don't be afraid to play. Thank you, Katarzyna. Okay, so it's, it's fun with vocab. Words matter. Close encounters. Okay. Befriending collocations, beautiful. Okay, collocations are key. Three M. Excellent. Okay, you you are the best. Okay, well, thank you very much for being with me and with us uh, at the beginning of the new school year. On behalf of uh, the whole uh, team of trainers and experts and editors and authors at Macmillan, I would like to to wish you a very, very successful year with vocabulary and otherwise. And I hope uh, to see you again very soon uh, on a number of meaningful, memorable and multiple occasions. OK, so thank you very much once again. Uh, if you want to stay in touch, uh, this is where you can find me, gregor.spierback at macmillan.pl. You can also friend me on Facebook, but you know how it is. <laughs> thank you very much once again. All the best.